tell you nobody's wrong. The truth is, I need you to understand what GitLab actually is. Right? GitLab is a suite of tools. Next slide. It's a suite of tools that actually wraps Git. If you've used Git individually, you've got a command line, you run a couple of commands, this is all good. But what we do is then build a lot of that and make it available to multiple people simultaneously through many views, options that are there. Using Git yourself is simple. Using your Git with other people is hard, and that's the thing that we're trying to address. But let me understand, let me make you understand that as a startup, monoliths aren't a bad thing, right? These are your simplest, clearest focus path to actually having a viable product. Nobody can use your awesome cool technology if you never make it off the ground because you've spent too much time doing too many things. Adding features while it's a monolith is dead simple because you have one code base and it just works. And most of your users are small test cases. These are good. But you have everything in one place. This is great. It's easy. You've got one, maybe two, maybe ten guys, and you can all work cohesively on a whole product. In the future, that might bite you. But right now, you're not planning to be Google. You're planning to ramp that way. The advantages are fairly straightforward. You put everything you need into one thing. It's going to make it easy for people to install and use. And then you're going to be able to give that to other people to actually go and use and test and learn. You can get better as you go. The good news is now you can also control things very, very easily. The bad news is now you're shipping a brick. And this piece of concrete does not change very often. And when it does, you have to ship a new version, the whole version, every time. The good news is, because you're shipping an exact brick, you know exactly where it fits every time. But every time you need to change it, somebody's got to go in, pull it all out, put it all back in, and just triple check. But they know the triple checking will be a checklist and not, what didn't I do this time because I don't remember what I did last time. The problem is, the more you build, the bigger it gets. And the bigger it gets, bigger it gets. They end up being massive, singular things that stand off on the landscape, and they're very hard to maintain when you start to scale. They become unwieldy, as you need to have more than one of them to keep up with the number of users that you have. Our omnibus is great, because we use it. Our customers use it. It's the exact same thing. The bad news is, most corporate companies aren't over 10,000 users, or 100,000, or a million, or 260,000 repositories in a day. Needs to say, if we were still here, somebody would have driven a truck up to the base and we would have watched it go like this. Because the truth is, once you've got one monolith, how do you deal with this? What's the root of the problem on a monolith when you, when you go, oh crap, I have to have more than one now? Well, let's go all the way back to the foundation and let me tell you what's going on. Yeah, it's Git. So, the trick is, Git feels easy. It was designed and now it's maintained. It does a really good job at what it does for you. Your little repository with a hundred files is stupidly fast. You run a command, you don't even know something happened because it ran so fast. Well, let's look at what actually just happened in your little repository. Give us a snapshot of the versions of the files that you have. And then it actually keeps a copy of every single version that you've ever had on any file actually in your repository. That includes if you added it and deleted it and added it and deleted it five times. It's got five separate copies. They just don't show up anymore. These are then indexed and pointed 
and packed. And you now have how many copies of how many things if you've been doing this for a week, or a month, or 10 years? You have a ton of little tiny files, tons of them. The longer it goes, the more there are. The more people that are involved, the more branches there are, the more there are. The bigger, the slower. Don't believe me? Go check out the kernel. Clone it. Watch how fast it comes down. Here's a hint. Grab a coffee. <laughs> Two, check out any branch. I hope you did a full clone and not a slim one. Because then you're going to wait for the clone when you try and check out. Check out any branch. It doesn't matter which one. Do a diff against master and time it. There are millions of lines of code and hundreds of millions of versions and branches and everything else. Now hopefully the tree you had doesn't have everybody's downstream trees. This is why there are whole subsection maintainers in the Linux kernel because if we took the entire tree and went like this, you're going to need a 500 gigabyte disk to house the Git repository. How many files did I just touch? Just doing a diff. Anybody can, can actually estimate how many files I just touched doing diff? Here's a hint. One copy, two copy. Depending on the number of files that were actually changed, and this is somewhat optimized thanks to indexes and packs, you could hit anywhere between zero files and every file in the repository. So if you're making a massive sweeping change where all you did was change the license header on every file you have, you just made a change that touched every file and made a new copy of every file. And when you do a diff, it's looking at master and looking at this and reading every single file and going, what's different? Right? That's already beginning to seem a little painful. Now let's actually go do all these changes. Let's push those to our remote. And now let's go look at it in a web browser with 10 of our friends simultaneously. Okay, scale's getting a little harder now. Now multiply that by 10,000 or 100,000. Needless to say, suddenly the disk is a lot more important than it looks and we're not lucky enough to be streaming files where we go, okay, you want this version? I know it's four gigs. You can only fit two gigs. We're going to transcode it live. We're good. One big fat stream. No, we're going to go read a bajillion tiny files. And that's expensive at the disk. Very expensive at the disk. So let's what can we do to scale this out? Okay, we need to address this. Standard practice says when you have a small system, what do you do to get more disk performance? You raid, you stripe, you add more disk, you start to shard disks across mounts. Cool! That's not enough. We have a million. Oh crap. Okay, cool! SSDs, they're faster! Here's the problem. Now how do I get models that have gone from 1 to 2 to 3 to multiply it by 100? How do I get all of them to get to all those disks from all the places? We've solved the disk speed problem, but we haven't solved the problem of getting it everywhere. Next thing in standard practice. Whoops. Solve one problem and cause another. Now you've got three. Now you've got six. We don't have a disk bandwidth problem anymore. Now we have a network throughput problem. It works to a certain point. And then no matter what, if we want to use the great old analogy of series of tubes, you can only fit a bus down a subway. You're 
not going to fit it down a drain. It's not going to work. Even if the bus depot really is on the other side, oops, not going to fit. No matter how hard we want, we can't make NFS magically scale to billions of files. We introduced NFS. It solves a lot of problems. We can now scale horizontally, and we can scale the disk vertically. But now we've got two axes and one big flat one that just keeps kind of breaking the edge. NFS is great because it does a lot, and it's easy to implement, and at smaller scales, it does wonders. And I say smaller as meaning down into the hundreds. You're okay. But it's only two problems that you have. Disk I.O., network throughput, and NFS. Because now you have both in one place. SANS only solves so much when you have 300 things touching the same set of files. So SANS don't quite work, but that is a traditional way around it. The thing is that monoliths then have a problem. They get to a certain point where they start to tip when the load gets too high. Why? Because we're taking the entire foundations and giving it a solid shake all the time. And then the wind's coming and blowing us over as hard as it can. But that didn't happen to us. Why not? No problem, new answer. If I had a disk I.O. problem and I solved that by making sure the disk were as fast as I could possibly get it, and then I created myself a network problem because I was now trying to access all of the file contents over the network, so when I needed to hit a thousand files, I read them all over the network. Seems like it'd be simple, right? Okay, not quite. We learned that one the hard way. It was the right answer at the time, but not for long. Instead, we've created Diddly. And we've taken all of this network of reading the disks and everything else, gigantic requests, gigantic responses, and don't get me started on how file system caching does and does not work on NFS and where it works at and whether the hit rate is any good. Here's a hint. Large files, billions of tiny files? No. What we did was we created a service that works as a gRPC endpoint. Instead of going to the local disk, working with, since we're based on Ruby, working with Rugged and actually trying to read all the local files, and then hitting NFS, and then thus hitting the network, and doing all of this ridiculousness back and forth, creating load that eventually won't scale because the pipes just aren't that big. We actually proxy the call through libgit2 over the network. And then we place this on the machine that actually has the disk. System is here. Why is it important to actually have the machine that has the disk be able to read the files for you? File system hit cache. Give it a crap ton of RAM, give it a crap ton of disk, and it will do a good job of reading files 50 times a second, especially if it's the same file. Do that over the network and make 300 separate people trying to read different files. The NFS server now has to keep track of all 300 billion files versus this is your section of the data. I want to talk to you about it. Here's 300 people only asking about this piece instead of all of the pieces. We solve the problem by optimizing where the problem is addressed. Small network request, small network response. We ask for a diff, we get a whole diff back. We don't have to worry about actually doing the diff operation. The thing with SSDs and a crap ton of file cache is doing a much better job than my web front end will. This thoroughly reduces network throughput, which means we can actually scale this well inside of the pipes that we have. Now we don't have to have 
APIs and service nodes that actually have to have the disk for Git, which is our most expensive operation but the core of our product. By addressing the specific problem, we can solve most of our scaling issues off the bat. Question? Yeah, could you scale up the network? You know, from gigabit, 10 gigabit, 4 gigabit, 10 gigabit? The question for the audience at home is, did we scale the network by going gig, 10, 40? The answer is, it's not our network. Okay. We have no data center. We're crazy people and are using other people's computers in the cloud. Another question. Sorry? How do we interact with Git? Um, that is another talk for one of our actual architects on the Gitly project. But suffice it to say, actually we do spawn Git processes from time to time for certain operations because they're better at it than libgit. But primarily speaking, if you can do it in libgit, whichever programming language can interface with it, you can do it with a shell. If you want, partially the shell is kind of a pain in the butt sometimes. So the good news is the monolith that's now falling over has a big fat prop under it. Now we can focus on other problems. Moving forward, right? Now I can have hundreds of API nodes and hundreds of web servers. And they're not going to fall over when the NFS server dies because it's got 300 nodes trying to read 3 million files. But now I have some other things that I need to look at. My biggest, fattest choke point ever has been somewhat addressed. Question real quick? Uh, the question is, have we looked at GVFS in replacement of NFS? Here's the trick. If I'm accessing a file over the network, I'm still accessing a file over the network, the whole file. It doesn't matter whether or not it's Ceph or NFS or Samba. It's the whole file every time. By relocating where the disk access is actually done, we take the load off the API and it can respond to more things on a regular basis. We put it onto the network service, we reduce network throughput, and get the local optimizations of the local file system cache. No network file system will magically fix that. GVFS, as it comes along with Git, will not magically fix that for us. For an end user who has to deal with gigabytes upon gigabytes of an individual repository, that's a different story. But we need to operate on the entire repository at all times, not on a subsection which GBFS handles. Does that answer that question? All right. So what is our next thing that we've got going on? We've got Giddly in check. We've replaced all of our NFS sharding and no longer have 35 NFS mounts across hundreds of terabytes of disk. But now we have another problem. What about all the rest of the stuff that's on that NFS? That's kind of a problem. You have uploads from users. Somebody's got a meme. This guy's useful and has five screenshots. You've got artifacts, release card balls, job logs. All these things that you actually want to be able to retain and see, but Anybody who requests it needs to be able to get it. But now I still have 60 NFS servers across 300 nodes. What do I do with that? Because not even including the Git stuff, that's hundreds of terabytes. If I need to make it so I can scale my nodes without having to worry about if I'm going to kill my file servers, what do I do? It comes down again take the file system away. Instead of having to deal with the file server and making our clients deal with the file server and who's ever done an NFS server for 500 people at the same time? One, two, three, yeah, exactly. If you had a choice between an NFS server for 10 people and 500 people, which one would you do for the rest of your life? 
The ten. Yeah. Now imagine we walk into a customer and goes, yeah, so you have 10,000 people. You're going to need 10 nodes. I hope somebody knows how to do NFS really well. Right? This is cool. We can train them. We can show them how to do this. But there's a problem. We're actually adding to the technical requirements of the customer by mandating NFS. To make it simpler for us to actually run at scale and for the customer to be able to choose which way they do things, we implemented object storage but left legacy NFS behind. This way you don't have to have new knowledge, but we're able to be cloud native and you can too. Once we have the actual state separated, we can now go to the concept of what are pets and cattle. From a rancher's perspective, what's the difference between the dog and the cows? That one makes me money. I really don't care about his state because somebody's eventually going to go eat him. Right? But his dog is a workhorse. He's a friend. It's important. It has to be catered to. It has to be kept healthy. If you get one cow in the herd that gets mad, you put it down. Your dog gets sick, you treat it. You take it to the vet. You manage it. You make sure it's got a happy life. Stateless systems are the cattle, the API servers that no longer need file service access, the endpoints that are serving web content that don't actually have to have file service content anymore because they can get it from elsewhere, are now cattle. We're stuck with pets for the stateful information. The giddies, our database, and our cache. Redis, Postgres, Giddly itself. But everything about the application now no longer cares where it is, but it doesn't require it to be on itself. Now we can actually look at the possibility of scaling without a fight. Because now we don't have to have some poor fellow spend 12 hours scaling three times just to make sure we keep up with the load. And for everyone's information, no, we never went out. Our monitoring server did because y'all had made it so heavy that we had to put it with 256 gigs of RAM. But we never went out. We got a little choked, we got a little backlog, but we never went out. So let me explain how the pet's behavior was. It used to be that every single omnibus was on every single node, and then we turned features on and off. So we'd have a service type, it'd be declared, and you'd have this feature and that feature, and this feature and that feature, and this feature and that feature, which meant we installed over a gigabyte of stuff to run as little as a 2 meg program on every node, all the time. This is a definitive downside, because now it's really simple because we've got one cookie cutter and we can configure them the way we need, and it works really well. But imagine how long it takes to start a whole node. This process takes a minimum of two minutes and can take up to ten for one. Imagine I need to add 16 new API servers because we've suddenly got hundreds of thousands of imports. I can start them in parallel, but my response time is still going to be this far out. There's nothing I can do. And then they have to start up and they have to spin up and contact the remote services and make sure everything's happy. So it's going to be 10 to 15 minutes while we scale. We're working on it. Right? That becomes a little bit of a problem. Don't even get me started on clustering. Ugh. But, now that I have all my services to the point where they don't actually physically require the file system, and they don't have to be co-located, do you notice how much smaller those got? Everybody wants to, ooh, containerization, containerization, containerization. We have created containers because it's an easy way for us to distribute the binaries in a controlled fashion. That's why we've chosen. I can take 
the minimum requirements, and I can put them together and guarantee no matter where I go, that's going to work. I could ship per distribution packages, but then when I need to have five more API, API services running, and I have 32 cores already, but I don't need a whole other VM to go start and do this, it seems a lot more straightforward to just make 15 more API servers. Just like that. With that network and CPU overhead, go for it. Versus making more VMs, installing packages. Let's go through the process of installing a system, doing system updates, praying it doesn't take forever and nobody's repos down, etc., etc. It is optimized for what we need to do, so we've chosen containerization to be our cattle. There are downsides. We still have some legacy debt. We have one process that acts as a smart proxy in front of our actual Rails application because Rails is not great at serving a bajillion tiny files. I'm talking about the actual user uploads, downloads, things like this, Rails. It's not that it's bad at it, but the performance could be highly improved. This process does speak sockets. does it very well. The problem is it doesn't speak TCP sockets. And the likelihood that we're going to fix that right away is fairly low. It's a tiny process. You stick it in front of the Rails app application, and whether it's an API or a service, it does its thing without eating too much memory or performance. Ah, okay. There's also the thing that it likes to share the temp directory. <laughs> Those are harder than you think. And when you don't have the manpower to do that, sometimes you just go ahead and co-locate the small thing with the big thing until you have time. Hence, time constraints. If you have a project and you need it to be more resilient than it used to be, even if you have 270 plus employees across 40 countries, if you have to ship a product on the 22nd of every single month, and it's got to be good, and it's got to be better, and it's actually got to improve for us and our customers, do we have the time to do everything ideal? No. We've done our absolute best, and we continue to iterate over time. We take the best look we can. We take an approach that will get us there in the end, but is not necessarily the direct route to perfection. This is why monoliths are a good thing in the beginning, but at a certain point, you have to begin the migration to microservices. Now, there are other things that you will hit on the road, like can you actually tell me how much CPU and memory that process will actually need when it's not co-located with 10 others? No. Time to find out. You know how much your server needs when it's installed on a service that has a one gigabyte package that unpacks to one and a half and then runs and eats eight gigs of RAM minimum. Mind you, that's a database and a server and a Redis and a file storage. But have you actually isolated out what each component does, what it requires, and what you can expect out of it? What about, where's the upper limit of the CPU performance on that process, and where should you tell it starts scaling ahead of time? No problem. Then how do you load balance stuff? Web, web APIs and servers. Cake, right? We all know how to do this. Mostly. But do you know the actual metrics on how many API calls you get versus how many service calls you get versus how many memes you get downloaded? Which things do you actually load balance? How heavily do you load balance them and which tech do you use to do it? These questions come up. Scaling? Do you do it horizontally? Do you do it vertically? Do you add more services to one node because magically you've got overhead because this thing's not doing anything? which tells you you don't know what it's doing? Or do you do horizontal and add more nodes? Hundreds of nodes. Ten nodes, one node. How much can you fit? They're important things. And can you do it automatically?
rarely do you have to think about doing it manually on a regular basis. Again, you need to know how far you can do it automatically and how far you can't. But the biggest question is, what happens when things fall over? The fun one we actually saw was we have a CI cluster, and in that cluster we actually have, as of the last day I looked, which was Wednesday before I drove down, we have 15 instances of GitLab deployed in this cluster. All of it. The database, the readers, Gitly, everything's inside it. Did you know that if you have the out of memory killer trip, it, you can kill your entire network stack if you're using a managed provider and it will just drop off the network. I'm not sure how we managed to do that, but we went and we looked at the scheduler and it turns out that those processes that actually demand two gigs a piece were set to ask for 512 max. And it scheduled 40 of them. Needless to say, splat. It was kind of funny. And then we fixed it right away. That's the process of where we're at it right now. I'd like to ask for any questions in regards to the talk now. But before I do that, I want to point out our actual target is to make what we're doing even easier than the omnibus install, if that's at all possible. And for you of you, any of you that actually have installed or managed local copies, you know it is our pride that that is so easy for you every single upgrade. That is what I do every day, is make sure that that's perfect for you guys. I want this to be that easy, but I need it to be that easy at our scale and for our largest customer scale because as I just showed you, you guys have it easy. <laughs> Ours is hard. We'll be hitting beta this month. Alpha's out. If you want to look at it, you can. Please, please, play with it. Tell us what we broke. We're still working on it. Information available here, and I will make sure that these slides are available to everyone else. So, questions, comments, before we get into the whole news cycle thing? <laughs> wow, I actually answered them all mid-talk. I feel good about that for once. Nice. All right. Well, thanks for everyone coming. Hopefully this was informative about why microservice to monolith is the wrong way, but monolith to microservice makes a whole lot of sense if you actually want to grow and not figure out how to make 10 guys work on 10 things at the same time and pray to God the Lego bricks work. Thanks. Now with that said, who wants to go for the new cycle?